Hi, everybody. I want to welcome you to today's lunch with the league, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm Lori Thiel, president. With a little bit of background, as you all know, the league is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support or oppose candidates or parties, but we do understand that choosing your elected representatives is a very important part of what we as voters have to do uh, during the election cycle. So we defer to organizations that do vet candidates and that do evaluate candidates, and that is the purpose of this discussion here today. Perhaps one of the hardest categories of candidates to choose are the judici judicial candidates, and they're hard for a lot of reasons, and we're going to talk about those reasons today. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started with the introduction here to give you a um, sense of who we have to chat with us today, and then we'll get into some questions and answers. We're doing this today a little bit different if you've been to any of our presentations before. We typically have a, a panel discussion and PowerPoints and we do an entire presentation, but we thought today would be easier to just do a Q&A interview type. I'm going to go through some basic questions and we're going to have a, a discussion up here. And please write down your questions as we go. You'll see three by five cards on your table and pencils. If any of this discussion you watch um, raises questions in your own mind, just jot them down because when we finish our conversation up here, we will take questions from, from you. So I'd like to start by introducing the Honorable Susan Finley. She's been a part of the legal community for over 35 years. She retired from the Superior Court in March of 2000 and sat on assignment as a member of the Assigned Judges Program administrator, administrated by the Chief Justice of California Supreme Court. After sitting on assignment for 12 years, she mediated family law cases and served as a private judge for the National Conflict Resolution Center until December 2017. During her judicial career, she was assigned to the South Bay and Juvenile Courts. Beginning in 2000, she sat on assignment in criminal, domestic violence, and family law courts. She served on the advisory committee to the Chief Justice for the Assigned Judges Program until December 2011. Um, and the State Domestic Violence Task Force from 2007 to 2015. She's a former Dean of the Judicial College of California and served as Director of Education for the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. I know that's a, that sounds like a lot and I just raced through it, but I wanted to include that because it gives you an idea of the breadth of judicial experience um, that Susan has. So that's going to give you an idea about um, the perspective that she's going to bring to this discussion today. <coughs> She also started the drug court in the South Bay. Since leaving the bench, she has spent a majority of her time volunteering for one, uh, our one community. It's a charitable organization which assists a remote tribe of Maasai on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. She also volunteers for the Greater San Diego Assistance League, which helps support children in need with school necessities as well as college scholarships. She is the vice president of the Coronado Democratic Club and is involved with planning educational programs for its 178 club members. And she's currently serving on the San Diego Bar Association's Judicial Election Evaluation Committee. That is what we're here to talk about today. And um, we're so delighted to have uh, the Honorable Susan Finley discuss this with us. Thank you, Lori, and thank you to all the members of the women, uh, the League of Women's Voters. Uh, your work is extraordinary, it is important, and I have had the privilege of being uh, present at a um, League of Women Voters panel for uh, the election for the candidates for the Board of Supervisors, and your member, Jeannie Brown, was the outstanding uh, person who controlled that debate uh, very well, and I got to be one of the question screeners. So I was very close to the podium and watched her in action, and it was a great experience. So your work is important. You educate voters, and more importantly, uh, inspire them to go to vote, which is the action that we all hope to accomplish. It, it, Aristotle once said, if liberty and equality are to be found in a democracy, then all persons must share alike in that effort and it will be attained when all persons share alike to the utmost. In other words, our government is us, we are, we are it, 
and it's our responsibility as citizens to do our part. So, I did my part on the bench as a judicial officer of some sort um, <clears throat> for 37 years and decided at the end of December 17, 2017 that was it. No more legal stuff, no more judge stuff, another life beckoned. Well, never say never. I got a call from uh, the president of the San Diego Bar Association uh, who wanted to know if I would be willing to serve on the Bar Judicial Election Evaluation Committee. This is a committee that was started in 1978, uh, which was before I was appointed, but as an appointed judge, I didn't go through that process. Uh, prior to going on the bench. But, as a lawyer, I was an active member of the Bar Association of San Diego County and understand that the members work toward uh, equal justice for all, they care about the system. After all, these are lawyers who appear in these courts. Uh, who, who better would have an interest in fairness and judges that are impartial and judges that are of appropriate temperament. After all, this is their workplace. So I said yes. And it's a four-year term, and uh, I've enjoyed the work so far. And then what happened, I got a call <laughs> from the League of Women Voters, Joni Halpern, who said, would you then come and talk about it? And I said yes again, but I want to say, that's it. I'm not going to do it anymore, uh, and this is it. But for you, of course I would. Uh, so, never say never, and here we are. Well, judicial elections, why are they a problem for the, uh, for the average voter? The average voter isn't in court. Uh, the average voter doesn't get to hear these candidates. Some do, some don't. And you really don't know why this race seems different. I mean, you understand it's nonpartisan for good reasons. So, why are these, who are these people? who are running for office, and how would you know who to vote for, and what criteria would you look at? Well, there's a good reason why these races are different, and one of the main reasons is, while campaign finance laws apply to everybody, the canon of judicial ethics, canon five, applies to all candidates for a judicial office, and what that says is, a judge or candidate for judicial office shall not engage in political or campaign activity that is inconsistent with the independence, integrity, or impartiality of the judiciary. And then, just to make sure, the Business and Profession Code, which applies to lawyers, adds, and by the way, lawyers shall abide by canon five of the judicial canon of ethics if they run for office. So there, it's a constraint, but for a good reason, and you're not going to see political ads that are wild and make wild statements, and, and it's very restrained. Uh, we would hope to reflect uh, the dignity of the office. So, and the other reason is that these candidates are not multi-billionaires, for the most part, not that I'm aware of, and they really don't have a lot of funds to spend on ads all over the place. So what they do, as Alana and Michelle can attest, they go to as many events as they can, they speak as much as they can, they try to meet as many of the voters as they can, but in a county the size of San Diego, that's pretty tough. And yes, they are running countywide. So let's take a look at the overall structure. How are judges, why are judges appointed? Why are some elected? The California Constitution sets the, Sandy, the uh, trial court of California, which is known as the Superior Court, at a six-year term. Appellate justices, including the Supreme Court of California, serve on 12-year terms. If there is a vacancy in any of those terms, then whoever is the sitting governor appoints someone to fill that vacancy. So for example, if you are appointed to the Superior Court in year four of a six-year term because the sitting judge retires, becomes disabled, dies, you will stand for election at the end of that term in two years. If no one files to run against you, 
then as a sitting judge, you will be automatically elected to the next six-year term, and your name never appears on the ballot. If, however, the sitting judge fulfills the six-year term and says, well, I would like to continue being a judge. I will fill out the papers for the next term. It's an open seat, and any lawyer who has served at least 10 years as a lawyer can file papers to run against you. That's the trial level. And there are, um, last count, around 1,735 trial court level judges in the state of California. Looking at the appellate courts, appellate courts are not organized by county. Every one of the 58 counties in California has a superior court. Every one of the superior courts has a different number of judges. San Diego has 185. Who decides? The legislature decides based on population, based on need. A county like Humboldt might have a very small bench. Uh, San Diego has a large one. Los Angeles, with over 500 judges, is one of the biggest court systems in the world. So, uh, California, uh, our population is almost 40 million. Last year, there were over 6 million cases filed in state courts in the state of California. There are 102 appellate court justices in six districts up and down the state, and seven Supreme Court justices. They serve 12-year terms, and at the end of the 12 year, what the voters see is a yes or a no. It is a retention election. Some of you might remember back in 1986, Rose Byrd, the, the first woman <coughs> Chief Justice of the state of California, and several of her colleagues, Broden and Reynoso and Broussard, were up for a yes-no confirmation. She was not confirmed for another 12 years, and neither was Grodin, and neither was Reynoso, and that was shocking at the time. It hadn't happened before. But so that's the difference. So let's focus on the trial court in, uh, in the San Diego County um, election because you have 11 candidates running for four seats. So this gives you an overall picture of the, the structure of the judiciary and why sometimes you're asked to say yes or no and sometimes it's popular vote. And if the, the seats that are being run for are all open seats this time. There is no incumbent running. Now last time there was. You might remember the contested election of uh, Judge Jer um, Creep was challenged by three or four lawyers, one of whom, a district attorney, Matt Brower, defeated the, the sitting judge by a sizable percentage of the popular vote. So if neither gets 50%, then we're looking at a general election. So the primary could, could be the decisive time, but one of the seats has four candidates for it, so if all the votes split, there probably would be the top two running uh, <clears throat> at the uh, general election. So that's the general overall scheme, and I understand Lori has come prepared for some questions for me, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the rest of you may have as well. Thank you, that's, that was a very comprehensive overview. So we'll get into a couple of details. Um, because the <clears throat> purpose of this, or one of the purposes of this discussion today is to try to figure out how to vote um, perhaps you can spend a little bit of time just talking about the Bar Association's Judicial Election Evaluation Committee, which you serve on, how the committee works, like what the purpose of it is, why it was established. Um, for example, how many people serve, how many members serve there, to give us a sense of like how broad the evaluation process is, and, and also discuss the ratings so that we can kind of understand We've probably all seen, or some of us have seen these ratings, um, and maybe you can tell what the ratings are and what they mean. Okay. Well, all right, uh, let's see. Um, the committee consists of 21 members. I am the only uh, judge, and it's a spot designated retired judge. And I think it was designated retired is once you're retired, 
and you're not sitting on assignment, you are a bit out in the fray, and you're old enough to have had many years of experience working with judges, seeing lawyers in court, thinking about um, what makes a good judge, how can I be a better judge, that you can bring something to the committee. The rest of the committee, very diverse, all lawyers uh, in San Diego from various different fields. There are government lawyers uh, from the Attorney General's office, from the U.S. Attorney's office, from the District Attorney's office. There are uh, lawyers uh, who serve at the public defender, so government lawyers. There are private counsel who do uh, personal injury work, who do uh, employment uh, cases. So it's a very diverse committee, um, I think, racially, sexually, sexual orientation, and everything you can think of to make a group of people reflective of the greater Bar Association, which is about 7,500 members in, the, um, in, in uh, San Diego. So yes, it's a diverse committee. You are asked to sign a confidentiality pledge, I mean, sign it in writing, uh, that you will keep all communications, all information gathered about all of these candidates absolutely confidential. You don't talk to your family, you don't talk to your friends, that information is confidential. And the reason why we take a, a pledge of confidentiality, a, an oath, is part of the process, a majority of the process, is sending out confidential questionnaires to lawyers in San Diego and we're asking them to give us an evaluation of a candidate's abilities as they relate to the job of being a judge. The, the responses are then quantified into a score which accounts for 75% of the, the rating process, which goes to 100. Then the interview, each candidate has an opportunity to be interviewed if he or she wishes, and that's 25 points. So it, this is a quantitative process, but it's a, it's a wide base of information gathering, including from the candidate, him or herself, and then uh, the committee assigns a, a rating, and it's not an endorsement. The Bar Association does not endorse any candidate. Other groups do, not the Bar Association. Say for example, well not example, there are four candidates running for one seat. The Bar Association's rules would prohibit us from comparing those. So the same subcommittee would not interview all of those four candidates because the danger might be you'd fall into, well, gee, she's better than he is or he's better than she is, and we want to avoid that. So those are spread out to different subcommittees, none of whom know what the other subcommittees are, are doing until the results come out. So the various uh, uh, overall ratings are exceptionally qualified, and this is a person who has exceptional uh, professional ability, experience, competence, integrity, and or temperament indicating an exceptional ability to perform the judicial function. Next is well qualified, presently possessing a high level professional ability, experience, competence, so on. Then qualified, presently possessing professional ability which would enable that person to perform the judicial function. Lacking qualifications is presently not possessing professional ability, experience, competence, integrity, or and or judicial temperament indicating ability to perform the function. And those are the categories. Like once again, not an endorsement. Uh, this is a result of the um, investigation process. It is an investigation, but who is the source of information? the legal community. Sitting judges always get these confidential questionnaires and are asked to fill it in. Have you seen this candidate in court? 
Did you think the candidate acted with integrity? Uh, did he, was he honest with the court? Did he treat opposing counsel or she treat opposing counsel with respect? How about the level of civility? Is this person, does this person dump, demonstrate uh, patience, um, open-mindedness? And what I'd like to point out is there are many, many wonderful lawyers, I mean brilliant attorneys who do an outstanding job for their clients who aren't necessarily cut out to be in a black row. And I, there are a couple examples of this. One of the things we look for, and you think, well, how simple is that, is decisiveness. Well, uh, we had a situation in California, in the Palm Springs area, where a judge was appointed by one governor or the other and uh, couldn't make up his mind. He took cases under submission. Case and case and case and case. And if you, there's a rule that you have to sign a little uh, statement in order to get paid that you do not have any cases under submission more than 90 days. Well, he certainly did, and they found about two years of cases in his chambers when they went in because why? Litigants started to complain. Uh, litigants started to say, wait a second, we, we've been trying to get divorced <laughs> for a couple of years. What's happening here? Uh, we'd like to get on with our lives. So you can file complaints with the Commission on Judicial Performance regarding a sitting judge. Um, who gets complained about, uh, who gets complained to about lawyers? The Bar Association has a disciplinary system. So these are sources of information. In the recent election where Gary, Cree uh, Judge Creep was uh, not elected, he had 29 uh, serious uh, allegations, apparently, uh, from what I read in the paper, uh, from the Commission on Judicial Performance. Well, of course his opponents would use that in their campaigns uh, as a way of saying, look, this person shouldn't be re-elected. Re He's been disciplined publicly by the Commission. So there are ways to find out information about various candidates, and, I, and the Bar Association Committee uh, evaluation is only one. There are many, many organizations, such as yourself, uh, if you go online and look at Judicial Candidates San Diego, you will find the VotersJudgesGuide.org. It's like Yelp. You're going to see reviews of judges all over the place and reviews of lawyers. Uh, when I was on the family court bench, we used to look at something like San Diego Judges dot com or org or something because so many of us were getting blasted all the time by some person who was really unhappy with what happened in court. The longer you're a judge, the more you're apt to see that because guess what? Everybody can't win a case. There is usually someone who prevails. Now, especially in family law, that means the person who didn't is really unhappy. And that person certainly has the freedom to complain all over the internet about how stupid the judge was or how biased the judge was. And so you go online, whew, you're going to find out lots of stuff. But as a voter, you have to figure the source. Now, one place, um, I know I'm moving away from the committee a little bit, but uh, how about the ballot statement? Every candidate has to find one. Read them. What do you think? How about the campaign website? You go on that, who's endorsing this judicial candidate? The police organization, the unions, uh, whatever. Uh, political party endorsements? I understand, I certainly know that the Democratic and Republican parties do publish lists of their favorite candidates. What does that mean? They think those candidates reflect that party values. Uh, so you just can keep going. The newspaper. Uh, if you Google San Diego judicial election, the Union <coughs> Tribune uh, will pop up. They did uh, a rating or an endorsement. Theirs was an endorsement. So there are many, many sources. The Bar Association does not endorse. It does rate candidates based on input from the legal community, including judges, and the interview. 
So I probably didn't get all of them, but I did my best. Oh, well, I've got some follow-ups. <laughs> Um, so, in particular, this is just a yes/no, but you could expound on it if you want. Would like your committee, the evaluation committee. Does it look at candidates' um, records? Does it review their practice? Um, does it look at their rulings, etc., as part of that evaluation, or is it more like you were just saying? You gave some examples. You know, how does like more about the demeanor and the respect, etc. All right. What what is uh, we ask for when we, the confidential questionnaires are sent out, and we're asking for a yes, sometimes or no response in relationship to a to candidate X. Please tell us: Does the candidate demonstrate fairness and objectivity, integrity and honesty, decisiveness? judgment and common sense, judicial temperament, knowledge of the law or application of the law in their judicial assignment if currently a judge, professional reputation, trial experience, intellect and ability, tolerance, lack of bias, compassion and understanding, work ethic, courtesy and patience, caseload management, writing and research skills. These are the uh, qualities that we're looking for. And then, a big question, does the candidate exhibit or has the candidate exhibited any bias, race, bias, colon, race, sex, sexual orientation, national origin, disability, social status, religion, or political affiliation? And those, that answer is yes or no. And then we ask the respondent to expand on the answer. So what it is, is a survey would be another word for it, a poll would be another word, from a wide source of lawyers and judges in the San Diego community. That's where the information comes into the community from. The committee does not go out and do independent investigation. No committee member does on his or her own. Uh, we have a process. The rules of this committee are posted on the San Diego County Bar website, open to anyone. If you go on the San Diego County Bar website, you will see judicial evaluation or something. Click on that box, and then at the bottom of that box, there's a link to these committee rules. The committee rules are followed. In fact, if any committee member violates them, they can be removed from the committee. If you see a candidate, for example, come through, uh, personally, I did not, because I'm so old and so retired, I didn't know a lot of these people anymore, but some of the newer lawyers had worked with them, and were in the same office, and uh, they recused themselves. I cannot participate or vote on candidate X because I am in the same government office. And we are expected to do that, just as a judge would recuse him or herself if a case came before you that you felt you could not be fair. Uh, for example, you had recently been through a horrific divorce and you were very angry over the uh, uh, outcome, you might recuse yourself. I had a friend who was a judge in Los Angeles who as a child was subject of a tug of war between her mother and father, ended up having to testify in a horrific custody trial, and it made her so ill and so traumatized that as an adult, she could not be in a family law courtroom. She just couldn't do that assignment. It brought back, she probably had post-traumatic stress syndrome, but she was incapable of doing that and had to recuse herself. So there are instances where that occurs. One thing I wanted to add about um, the brilliant lawyer who finds him or herself uh, as a judge and realizes it wasn't a good fit. There's a case of a lawyer in uh, Northern California, brilliant, brilliant um, appellate, court of appeal lawyer, did a, appellate briefs, seeped in the law, knows all the cases, very intellectual, high level, work. He was appointed to the Superior Court in Oakland and found himself in an arraignment court looking at a hundred 
dopers, prostitutes, drug dealers, thieves, and was just blown away. I mean, this was not his law, this was not his idea of the judge in this quiet environment. This was chaos, and he resigned. He said he was smart enough to say, look, this is not for me, I'm out of here. <laughs> so it's not always, just because a person's a brilliant lawyer, there are other qualities like temperament, ability to be listened to both sides. Sometimes what makes a great advocate a great advocate is that they are focused and passionate on an issue, and the other side doesn't even exist for them. That's why they can be so good. So a judge is different. <coughs> Thank you. Um, while we're on this topic, and then we'll move on, but um, I'd like for you to discuss the opportunities that, or the recourse that a candidate has if he or she objects to the rating that your committee gives them. Um, the uh, committee rules provide for an appeal. So any candidate who receives a lacking qualifications result has the right to appear before the whole committee. To explain that a little bit better, the candidate will be interviewed by a subcommittee that may be five or six people, four or five people, and that's who they see. The subcommittee makes a recommendation to the whole committee and explains why. If the result after the whole committee votes is lacking qualifications, that person is sent a letter by the chair and given an opportunity to come and speak to the whole committee and, and, and say, you made a mistake. Uh, you need to take another look at this. Uh, that's the process. It's like uh, when uh, the, the governor is looking to appoint someone, there is a state commission called the Jenny Commission, Judicial Nominee Evaluation Commission. They send out these questionnaires too. That's what happened before my appointment. So 100 lawyers may be sending in information. Their results are never conveyed to the public, ever. And the only person who finds out they've been ranked and they'd be unqualified in that system is if it's you, and then you get a chance to appeal to the Jenny Commission. So those results are never made public. The Bar Association results are publicized because the purpose is to help educate the voters in San Diego regarding the qualifications of the various candidates. Thank you. Um, last question on the committee. Can you tell us how long you've been serving on the committee and why you have confidence in its ability to do a good job and inform voters? I was asked to serve on the committee um, maybe September. Uh, it uh, I could have been late summer, but recently, say within the last six months. So I'm just at the beginning of a four-year term. When I first, when I went to my first meeting of this committee, all of whom I think were many, many years younger than I am, I was really impressed by the diversity of this group. Keep in mind that when I was, uh, when I graduated from law school, there were no women judges on the bench. There were 65 yeah. women practicing law in the county of San Diego, and I know because we put the women students put together a luncheon, and I had to write the invitations, so I know how many there were. <laughs> we were under a federal decree, the county being under a federal decree to hire women in a government office because they didn't. We couldn't get a job. Uh, <clears throat> I was asked when I interviewed at a law firm, um, <laughs> well, I see, uh, Ms. Finley, that you have two children. What do you intend to do with them while you work? <laughs> at which point I realized I was not getting a job with this firm, so I said, I thought I'd lock them in the closet. <laughs> And you know, to this day, I still get angry thinking about it. I just got a hmm, because it was demeaning, humiliating. I graduated with honors from law school. I got the Chancellor Scholarship. I won an award for trial. I was advocacy and did that matter. No. So to me, to be in a committee with women 
and man, with such diversity, it was really exciting. And yes, things have changed in certain respects, so this is good. I was impressed by how seriously this committee takes its responsibility. There was no joking around, there was no anything. It's very serious attention. The time involved was a bit shocking uh, because it takes a lot of time. And each candidate, I felt, had the process applied in exactly the same way, which is an attempt by the Bar Association to be as fair as possible. Are the results perfect? Well, I would venture to say anything involving human beings has the likelihood of not being 100% perfect. Of course not. But the attempt is sincere, and following the process was strictly adhered to. Uh, we had to say, if we had contact with any of these candidates elsewhere, we reported it to the chair of the committee. So the chair could decide whether to take us off or not, or to uh, recuse us. Uh, I was very impressed with my colleagues. Uh, they worked hard, they care about the quality of judges on our bench, and I think each person really did his or her best to, to be fair, to um, apply the process in an equal, fair manner. Great. So let's talk a little bit about the motivations for becoming a judge. Perhaps you can share with us your own motivations for that you know, seat, and also anything that you've gleaned over the years from you know, your co-workers and other judicial candidates. Well, going back to the old days, <laughs> when I graduated from law school, there were no women judges on the bench. There had been one, Madge Bradley, but she retired. Then a few years later, Artie Henderson was appointed, I think, by Governor Reagan, so at least there was one. But pro the, ju the judges were white and they were male. Most of them seemed awfully old at the time. They were probably 50 <laughs> or something. But anyway, they did seem old. So the, the option wasn't particularly apparent. I was just thrilled to be a lawyer. Uh, I was one of uh, three in my class of 173, so it was exciting to me just to be a lawyer. And I really, really enjoyed practicing law. I did criminal defense, I did some family law cases, and a lot of juvenile work. And one of the reasons I went to juvenile school, not juvenile school, one of the reasons I went to law school was I had been a teacher prior to going to law school, and I worked with a lot of students who were on juvenile probation, so I got to see what happened to them when they went through the juvenile justice system. And when I applied for law school, I wrote, I would like to be a lawyer so I could become a juvenile court judge. And, and then I forgot about that as the years went by, but that was there. So there I was, I was happy being a lawyer. And by the way, I was a divorced mother of two and was told with under no uncertain terms by the local bigwigs, no divorce, no divorced woman is ever going to get appointed to this bench. So it really wasn't at the top of my priorities. And then I was approached by the local Jenny, Commit Jenny committee, uh, the, the uh, some, a federal judge, a state judge, and a couple other lawyers, and they said, would you please send in an application to Governor Brown? Jerry Brown was in his first term. It was the late seven, 1970s, and uh, he was looking for people of color, for women, because he thought the bench should be more diverse. Well, I agreed with him. I thought it should be too. So it was presented as, you know, uh, here's an opportunity to add diversity to the bench. And one of the people I even remember say, saying, you owe it to other women, which was, a, I, I didn't think was exactly correct, but then I remembered uh, in the, prior to that time, after Rose Byrd was appointed Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, she spoke at a Lawyers Club luncheon. Oh, and by the way, Lawyers Club also endorses <coughs> candidates, and that's a large legal organization. And she spoke at a Lawyers Club luncheon, and I, I think it was, could have been in this building, it was on Harbor Island somewhere, 
And she walked in to give this speech, and I got chills because here was a woman who was appointed Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. I mean, it was, it was thrilling. And I thought at the time, oh my God, you know, things are possible. And so I thought about that when I thought about applying to the bench, and I thought, well, yes, I guess you can be an example, a mentor to other, to other women, to young girls, to say, follow your dreams and, and don't, don't accept these barriers that uh, have been put in our way. So I did uh, file an application and I was appointed in 1980 by uh, Jerry Brown and he did open the doors to diversity for the California bench and they never got closed again. So over the years, we have seen more and more people of color, more and more women appointed by all the, all the governors. And now I think about a third of the judges in San Diego County State Court are women, which is wonderful. We have a presiding um, judge of the San Diego Superior Court, Lorna Oxney, who is a woman. The presiding judge of the Fourth District Court of Appeal is a woman. Jury, uh, Judy McConnell. So things have changed. It's been a privilege to be a part of that uh, change and to experience it as, it, as it's happened. Uh, we always wanted things to be better for our daughters and our granddaughters. And we're getting there, slowly but surely. And it's been an exciting time. So was I happy as a judge? Well. Uh, I was an uh, active judge for 20 years, and then I retired the first time and sat on assignment. The assigned judges program lets you travel all over the state, and you can sit on different courts. El Centro in August is real popular because they seem, <laughs> they seem to have a lot of judges who go on vacation at that time. I remember once I was in Bakersfield, and, and I went to visit a judge who I'd known, who was gone, and I sent him a note, and I said, Dear Harry, I'm here in Bakersfield, where are you? And he said, I'm in Paris, you think I'm stupid? <laughs> <laughs> so we got called to fill in, and I was fortunate enough to uh, serve in San Diego County, which was close to home most of the time, and I did the domestic violence court for four or five years, and I did a family law court for uh, many years, and then I retired again, and went into private judging and mediation, family law cases, and did that for five years. So it's a total of 37 years of different iterations. I enjoyed every single one of them, and really did do my best to help. And lawyering and judging is problem solving. If you're the kind of person that likes to solve a problem, get the pieces, lay them all out, see how they fit, then apply the law, it's, it's a job for you. You would enjoy it. When I was a new lawyer, I went into a supervising attorney's office and said, I'm just sick of all these problems. <laughs> I'm sick of people's problems. And he said, Susan, that's what lawyers do. Lawyers solve problems. You might want to think about it. And so I worked it out and decided, of course, people don't come to you if they don't have a problem. And guess what? They don't go to court unless they've got a problem they have not been able to solve. If they can solve it, they settle the case before. So what cases do you get? The hardest, the ones that the participants can't settle. So they turn to a stranger in a black robe to do it for them. That's your job. Thank you. Um, as Susan mentioned, we had some pre-work by Joni Halpern. She's a league member who had kind of gotten pulled this together for us. And so in the conversation running up to this interview, Joni helped us coordinate some questions and we're going to talk now about what it means to be a good judge, what it takes, what qualities it takes to be a good judge, and we're going to review some of the um, issues that we discussed prior. So here they are right here. Well, a lot of judges have a little sign on their bench that says patience. <laughs> patience, patience, patience. Uh, and that is a quality that helps because a lot of times uh, you are well, first of all, I always thought being a judge was interesting because you never knew what was going to come through the door. It's like being in an emergency room, I guess, when you never know what the next structure is going to bring in. So 
case, every case was different. Um, even the driving under the influence, somebody said, how can you do those cases? Aren't they all the same? Well, no, because the people are different, the situations are different, the application, different laws might apply in addition to the DUI charge. So the variety was wonderful, which I enjoyed, but you have to be able to um, keep abreast of the changes. Just because you've become a lawyer or a judge doesn't mean you've stopped educating yourself. You've, and there are continuing education requirements. As dean of the Judicial College, I supervised oh, thousands of new judges who came through, and we had an orientation program for them that talked about judicial ethics. Uh, here's what you do, here's what you don't do. At the time, though this was uh, early 80s, uh, the big thing was marijuana, and we were instructed, well, if you're at a party and somebody produces marijuana, you have to leave immediately. And the new judge next to me said, well, there goes my social life. <laughs> but, but yes, it's a new way of being. So I guess, I guess the ability to set aside your personal, um, your personal predilections, if you will, the ability to con con conform your behavior to what is expected, uh, the ability to uh, to respect the office enough to say, I took an oath to follow the law because I don't agree with this particular law. I either follow it or go back to being a lawyer or do something else. In other words, you take an oath to follow the law. My hero, or one of my heroes, um, was a judge in Arizona who had a case involving a very young residential burglar convicted, and the law at that time in Arizona was mandatory state prison. And this was a kid, 18, 19, no prior record, nothing. And there were circumstances that led the judge to believe that the prison sentence was absolutely inappropriate. So we didn't do it. Gave him local time. And so the prosecutor appealed, and the Court of Appeals said, you will, that was an illegal sentence. You will impose the sentence required by law. So the morning of the sentencing came, case was called, judge walked out, unzipped his robe, folded it, put it over the chair, and said, I resign. Wow. So I always remembered, if I ever was faced with a situation where I really couldn't follow the law, Nobody asked me to do this. I filed an application. I applied. I would resign. So fortunately, I was never faced with that. The closest it came was during the time right after the three strikes law passed, back on the let's be tough on crime and lock everybody up period of time, when it was mandatory. And you might have a person who had priors who took, one was the famous one was the slice of pizza that ended up getting a sentence of life, 20, well, it was a lifetime term because of the priors. So what we did in the interim before judges had the option of striking a prior to avoid the lifetime sentence was to say, if I had the ability to strike this prior in this case, I would. I do not have that ability, and the law dictates this sentence thing. There were some for whom that sentence was totally, totally justified, and then some. And there were some that was absolutely inappropriate, but judges lost the discretion because the public perception was, well, defendant A gets 10 years, defendant B gets six months. I mean, it was a mishmash, and it was an attempt to get some, some type of structure so people would be treated equally. Since then, it has changed. It's been ameliorated somewhat, but yes, it's hard. So I would say patience is important, faithfulness to the law, the ability to understand the law, uh, to keep up with the changes in the law, the ability to say, to self-analyze and say, I don't think I can be fair in this case. Therefore, I recuse myself. 
there were a few cases where I did. I mean, you're not encouraged to recuse yourself because then any hard case that comes to the door or a case with a lot of publicity, there are reporters hanging around, you might say, oh, I don't want to do that. So it has to be a legitimate reason. You have to be able to put it in writing, give it to the presiding judge, and say, I can't hear this case because, you know, defendant is my plumber and he was just in my house fixing the sink last week. This would give an appearance of impropriety. Or, I know this person too well. We play golf together. What would, I mean, if, so you always had to think, what would it look like in a newspaper headline? Judge, judge here's case involving company in which she owns a million shares. Well, that's, that's a great headline, isn't it? So you have to be, you have to be able yeah. to be introspective to say, um, am I fair? Do I have the ability to be fair? You have to be open to the fact that we have a court of appeal system and the court of appeal could come down on you like a ton of bro bro bricks and say, how could you have ever done this ruling? And you have to be able to take criticism um, from unhappy litigants, perhaps, and just say, well, I did the best I could do. I, I tried my best. Um, you, you have to be able to uh, have a good work ethic and another thing nobody ever talks about is case management, and that's a hard one unless you're a lawyer in a very large firm and you're used to scheduling a zillion employees because running a calendar can be a challenge. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Um, you want to speak to the whole um, idea and the ability to understand the law and um, perhaps give a, an example that we discussed earlier today? Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay. Well, it requires a certain amount of intellectual ability, and lawyers, of course, have to pass the bar, which is a test of ability. So you, you can be confident that any lawyer in good standing uh, who has then become a judge or wants to be a judge has that level uh, of ability and, uh, and, um, because they've proven it. They've passed the bar. So what else happens, it isn't just what you see on TV, which is just the dramatic highlights, but using the Weinstein case, which we've all read about, I assume, in the paper lately, one of the interesting issues I thought was the number of women who were permitted to testify on incidents that were not charged in uh, the case at hand. And so what, what that was, was there were a long list of women who said the defendant treated me the same way as he treated these women who are the alleged victims of the specific uh, counts. And why would that be admissible? And the first thing the judge has to think about is, is it admissible? In other words, is it relevant to the charges? Well, how would something that happened five years ago in a different state to a different person be relevant to that charge. Well, there's an exception in the law that says, well, there is a part of the law that says you can admit evidence to establish a prior pattern of conduct or modus operandi. If this person has acted this way and these many times before, is it likely that these charges would charge the same behavior pattern are true? So then the judge has to determine, is it relevant? And this judge did determine, yes, four of them were relevant. I don't know how many prior acts we're talking about, but four others got to testify. Why? To establish a pattern of behavior. So the judge would have to look at the priors. Is it enough like the instant case to be relevant? If so, then the next layer would be, is it more probative than prejudicial? Or balance those. Is it more prejudicial than probative? And it could be. A simple case would be driving under the influence. The person had a prior two years ago, drove under the influence, got convicted. Well. Would that be admitted? The judge would have to decide, is it more prejudicial than probative or more probative than prejudicial? In that case, most judges would not let it in because all the jury would have to hear is, he just did it two years ago, of course he did it this time. We're not even gonna listen to the evidence. So the judge has to be very careful. 
So there's a lot that goes on, a lot of analysis that nobody else sees other than the judge and the lawyers in the case at hand. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, this is the last question that I have, and I, I'll gather, we've gathered some questions. If there are any other questions, you can give them to Kim or Jeannie, and this is, um, mm. then we'll go through these. So the last one is just, um, I would just like for you to talk in general about your confidence, or the, the public confidence in the judicial system. Mm. I think there's a pervasive view that perhaps the system is broken, and perhaps that's because of some of the issues that have led to where we are today. You've alluded already today, excessive sentencing, mandatory sentencing, um, but I believe that you might suggest that the judge mirrors the perception, the public perception of justice. So can you just talk about how judges interact with the public's perception and where we are um, in your mind as far as the criminal justice system? Sure. Well, the judges are the public face of the judicial system. That's who you see, that's who the headlines are about when there are headlines. So I think that what I've seen uh, in the last four decades was a failed mass incarceration experiment where the fear of crime drove us, and we were all responsible, uh, to pass laws that were very, very severe and had a disproportional a proportionate effect on, on minorities, the most vulnerable uh, and the most vulnerable. Uh, so we ended up with a huge population, uh, majority um, of black and brown people locked up compared to white uh, prisoners. So the perception, is my, and it's my understanding from the black and brown communities is that they have distrust of the criminal justice system and you could say, well, why wouldn't they if it hasn't treated them fairly? Or you could say, if you've been through a divorce and you were treated horribly unfairly, why would you trust the system if, it, if the results were so wrong? Uh, so that would be an individual uh, assessment as opposed to a whole community. It has not impacted um, the, the white community and looking around, that seems to be most of who we are today. Most of us probably haven't been in court as a litigant. There may be some, there's some lawyers here and uh, I certainly spent my four decades in court, but uh, most of people don't have that experience. So what they know is they, what they read in the paper, what they see on TV. I happen, I happen to watch a, a snippet of Judge Judy the other day. It could have been before the debate. And uh, guess what? The Commission on Judicial Performance gets more complaints about Judge Judy than any other, <laughs> than any other judge in the state of California. And they have a form letter informing the complainant that Judge Judy, one, is not a California judge, and two, she's on TV. So, you know, it, it's, it's the public perception. I think what we're seeing now is the pendulum swinging back toward reform. And you will be facing in November the bail, re the bail reform bill, really important reform stuff. When I started the drug court in uh, 1996, my colleagues thought I'd gone off the deep end. I mean, this just seemed ridiculous. Why would you want to bring people back into court every week we want to get rid of them. And I said, but, but it's a revolving door. We are seeing the same people over and over and over and over who are addicts because they're going to keep getting high and they're going to keep stealing stuff or hurting people. So this was considered, this was the beginning of the reform as far as treatment. How, why don't we look to treatment? And then I noticed in the ensuing years, as more and more white kids got into drugs, all of a sudden people got more interested in reform. Isn't that interesting? Okay, now we're talking about a problem that affects more of the population, so perhaps more of the population is interested in reform. So we're looking at a reform movement that is gathering steam and probably will continue to, and as voters we have to look at each of these measures that come before us in way is it going to help be the is the community will the community be safer? And I 
suggest to you that mass incarceration is a failed experiment. We need to come up with other ways to deal with offenses. Of course we want to be safe, but you can't lock up everybody to ensure that you're safe. There are some people who should be locked up and never let up. Don't, don't make any mistake about that. There are others who make a mistake, particularly young people. We know now that the brain doesn't even get fully developed till age 25 or 26. And some of these are children, very young children. Children do childish things, and sometimes they're awful. But can that person then go on to lead a good life? Sure if we have a community that supports rehabilitation and reform. Thank you. Okay, here are some questions from our attendees. <clears throat> How is it determined what type of cases each judge hears? And do the candidates know what type of case they'll be hearing? When the answer is the candidate has no idea what kind of case he or she, uh, what department he or she will be assigned to. And in fact, uh, if you were a family law lawyer, for example, the odds are you're not going to be assigned a family law until after you have done a rotation through the criminal court. Uh, you may be assigned a juvenile, you may be assigned a civil, you may be assigned a traffic court in some instances. So uh, no, you don't know what assignments you're going to get. And that's what happened to the, the uh, lawyer judge in Northern California who went from the, the um, academia or academic approach to appellate law to a, a real down and dirty arraignment court and went into shock, I think, because he, it wasn't what he envisioned. So candidates need to know they can be assigned to any department the presiding judge can assign them. And in some courts, not San Diego, but in Los Angeles, for example, if you spoke up and made a fuss, you could find yourself assigned to Compton. Or you could be driving to Pasadena or someplace hours, hours on the freeway. So, so in some courts, not San Diego, it was used as a form of discipline, which is pretty sad. So yes, you are at the mercy of the presiding judge. You will be sent where the presiding judge determines you are needed. Um, back, this is a question regarding your evaluation committee. Sure. Um, it's a several part question. The first is, how are those attorneys selected who received those surveys that you referenced? Oh. Um, and can you elaborate on the distinction between well qualified and exceptionally well qualified? Sure. Uh, each candidate for judicial office in San Diego County is asked by the bar committee uh, to file a personal uh, data questionnaire. In that questionnaire, they are asked, judges you've appeared in front of, opposing counsel on cases, counsel you've worked with, uh, a whole list of people. Uh, they are asked to list people who they would like us to send a confidential questionnaire to. And uh, it's usually a broad section of the community, of the legal community. So then, that's what the community does. The community sends out those questionnaires. All the judges, sitting judges get them, but then the lawyers that get them are lawyers that have been suggested by the candidate. And uh, if we get a response on those confidential questionnaires, one of the questions is, who else would be familiar with this, um, what is the question? Uh, please give the names of persons who could supply additional information regarding the candidate. So now we have the person filing the confidential questionnaire giving more names. Every single one of those is followed up on. What was the rest of that? <laughs> um, the elaborate on the distinction between um, oh, exceptionally oh, yeah. well qualified and well qualified. Exceptionally qualified is uh, exceptional. In other words, it's above and beyond what you'd expect to, to see. Well qualified and qualified are um, gradients. Uh, if you think between one and four, four being exceptional, exceptionally qualified, that's just they, they seem to, to have more experience, for example. 
They have handled uh, different kinds of cases as a lawyer. Um, it could have been, they've been a lawyer longer and have had more varied experience than the, the new lawyer. Um, they've worked on committees. They have uh, uh, shown exceptional things. Uh, well qualified is a very good rating. This is this person sure has all the abilities and qualified means they, they could do the job. And then and lacking qualifications, as I said before, would be uh, based on community, the legal community input and the interview doesn't quite come up uh, to the mark, which is 70, 70 points out of 100. Um, you know, prior to this interview, you and I discussed the um, ways that your committee evaluates the evaluations. Remember, you, we were talking about the outliers, that oh, perhaps yeah. there oh, is sure. some form yeah. of uh, bias, but that yeah. your committee yeah. could oh, detect gosh. that. Would you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, the committee is looking at, say you're looking at 50 responses, and 70% say exceptionally qualified. Uh, and then there's one that says lacking qualifications. That's an outlier. This could be a person who uh, worked in the same office and has a grudge. This could be opposing counsel in a very bitterly fought lawsuit that just is really ticked off at this person. So if you get an outlier like that, you just put it to one side because what you're looking at is the majority. And that's usually fairly consistent. Reputation in the community uh, is reputation in the community. And if most of the respondents say, well-respected, person of integrity, you can feel fairly confident that some of them have known the candidate, put down how long they've known the person, 30 years, 25 years. This is not, you know, we met in court once. Uh, so this is really, uh, we look at the, the majority, the consensus, if you will, and it could work the other way, where the majority says, woof, this person <laughs> shouldn't be on the bench, and there's one person who says, oh, she's the most wonderful person, she'd be a great judge. Well, that's the outlier on the other end, and we just push those to the side. We look at them. So earlier um, today, you discussed the campaign restrictions that are imposed on candidates um, in regards to like their websites and any yeah. oh, wild claims and accusations they can make. Can you speak to us about any funding restrictions that go along with those campaigns? Like where I'm, they get their money? No, I, funds? I, not, I, I, all I know is it's the same political campaign rules that apply to every candidate. Uh, that there are restrictions as to from whom, from whom can you ask money or who do you uh, solicit money from, and that would be, and that's in the code, and it would prevent uh, you from asking subordinate, um, if you're a judge, sitting judge, and you want to run again, you can't go around the courthouse and ask the employees and subordinate judicial officers for money because it would be an abuse of your position. Uh, if you are a supervisor in a government office, it would be considered inappropriate to ask everybody who works for you for money. So yes, there are restrictions on who you can get money from. And that's all reported, so it's certainly transparent. You have to file uh, your, your uh, campaign form, your <coughs> campaign finance form. So. And that's another thing, by the way, that judges have to do that most people don't know, but every year we had to file a form indicating um, where our sources of income came from. If it was unearned income from stock accounts, what, what stocks do you own the $10,000 or more? In other words, that's a public record. So all of a sudden you, you feel, well, gee, this kind of private information and you can run into problems like uh, when you're married to a person who's in business for himself. Well, all of a sudden he's going, well, wait a minute. I don't want you to write down all my clients and who we got money from. So, it, But sitting judges have to. That's a rule because why? The public wants to know where they're getting their money uh, to make sure they don't sit on a case that they shouldn't be on. Thank you.
Um, here's another question. Often those running or elected as judges come from the public sector, often in a prosecutorial role rather than public mm -hmm. defenders or private practice. Is there a bias toward attorneys in these roles? Well, it could well be that the public may be biased in favor of prosecutors. I don't know. Uh, if there's a bias, it would be from the, from the voters. And that's up to, I mean, I'm not aware among my friends that there is any particular bias one way or the other. Uh, maybe some people would be more biased toward a defense lawyer. It just is an individual thing, I think. Certainly from the committee, the Bar Association has no bias what's in that regard because it consists of both. I mean, we're, and both are represented on the evaluation committee. So in that sense, no. Um, but bias does exist uh, in the electorate, that's for sure. Um, back to the um, Judicial Evaluation Committee. You had alluded to the 21 members. Can you tell us a little bit about how you become a member of that committee, if you apply, and what the qualifications are for that? Well, <clears throat> I did not apply. I was asked if I would do it. Uh, by the president of the Bar Association. Now I'm assuming that the Bar Association puts out a list of committees and asks the members of the bar, are you interested in these commi any committee? And if someone says yes, that they would be considered. It is my understanding that the Bar Board of Directors determines the final list of who's on this committee. What criteria they use, I don't know. All I know is that they, everybody except me is an active lawyer from all different fields in the, in the law, and I'm the one uh, retired judge, and there are no sitting judges on it. <clears throat> um, we talked earlier this afternoon about the nonpartisan nature of the candidates, these candidates and the candidacy for judicial seats. Um, and we all know that city council members are ostensibly nonpartisan as well. Those candidates are ostensibly nonpartisan um, candidates for nonpartisan seats. However, we all have realized and we've watched this, um, the campaigns of our city council members and board of supervisors, et cetera, morph into more partisan campaigns. And we, I just wondered, the question here wonders what you see for the future of judicial candidates in that regard. Well, we are apparently, well not apparently, we are becoming more partisan. So the question I think really is how long can uh, the race for a judicial office remain nonpartisan? I hope that it does because this is pretty crucial. Uh, it's, it, in our state, in California, it is nonpartisan. Now, do, do governors appoint people from their own party? Yes and no. I would guess if you looked at all the lists of everybody appointed by Jerry Brown, George Duke Majin, Ronald Reagan, uh, Gray Davis, all, Arnold Schwarzenegger, all of them, you would find, I'm guessing, that a majority of the appointees would reflect that governor's political party. Not all of them. Uh, in fact, I was looking at a list on, the, on a, some website or other, and it had every judge on the San Diego Superior Court and active and which uh, judge, which governor appointed him. And I was surprised to see so many of my friends were appointed by Schwarzenegger because uh, it just never entered my mind. And when you're working with somebody, I, you don't focus on that. And I would have to say, I worked with Republicans, I worked with Democrats, I worked with people with no party, and it didn't matter because it's a nonpartisan job, and we weren't there to promote any particular party. We were there to uphold the law to the best of our ability. I don't even remember any heated political discussions ever. Um, we would discuss issues like bail reform or uh, setting up a domestic violence court or a drug court. So we were focused on issues. Now, maybe things have changed uh, since I was judge. I hope not. I hope not. I think it's important to recognize that the political parties that put out recommended candidates, they, they're proud, they are putting out lists of people who are in their party. Well, that's something the voters should take into account. Uh, 
look at the values of the different parties and that, that helps inform your vote. So I hope that we protect the nonpartisan nature of judicial races because you want a, a nonpartisan bench. You do not want cases decided based on political philosophy as opposed to the law. One of the uh, uh, voter guides did, and it was San Diego Judge Voter Guide or Judge Voter Guide that talks about activist judges and strict constructionist judges, and <clears throat> that's another way to do it. And, and you can take a look at that. But I'm hoping that we keep the nonpartisan uh, alive and well for judge races, because I can't think of any other position, and I, city council can be or not, but, or board of supervisors, <laughs> I don't know. But uh, judges, for sure, are not carrying water for their political parties. Um, well, that leads me to a, a, perhaps the last question, depending on how long the answer is. <laughs> no, um, and it's a, I think this framed is, is framed as a national a question on the, for the national um, polit political situation regarding the executive branch and the commentary from the White House on judges and justices and um, the lack of separation between those powers. Would you be willing to speak to that and your understanding and um, maybe perhaps concerns about that? Hmm. We have three branches of government federally, and they have served as the check and balance. That's important. Check and balance, check and balance. So no one branch can run amok, <coughs> theoretically, and, uh, <laughs> and the others can control it. So it's important to maintain the separation of powers. Looking at well, the fed, in the federal system, the president appoints federal judges for a lifetime term. There are no elections. They're there until they retire or die. Uh, then they have to be confirmed by the Senate. And one of the things about that it illustrates about the difficulty of selecting judges is judges are not supposed to comment on any issue that might come before them. So you're not, you shouldn't hear a judge talk about, I'm opposed to the death penalty, or uh, I'm in favor of a woman's right to choose, or Roe versus Wade. That is not appropriate behavior. So it is frustrating to have a candidate and you want to know, where do you stand on these issues? And the response is, where I personally stand doesn't matter because I will apply the law. And it's very frustrating. I, you can watch it happening during confirmation hearings on television, but the, the judge is in a difficult spot. The candidate is in a difficult spot. I remember at one point getting a questionnaire from some group that wanted to know all those things. Where do you stand on abortion? Where do you stand on this? Where, well, guess what? Uh, we hear those kind of cases. You cannot say in advance, I'm in favor of this, because you don't know the circumstances of the case that will carry that issue to you, and you may find yourself ruling in a totally different way, because that's what the law dictates. So yes, it's a concern when you have a court that becomes political. And that goes back to my statement, we need to preserve the nonpartisan nature of the job, not just of the, of the race, but the job. Because now you have judges who aren't following the law, or they're bending it to match their political um, beliefs, which is very, very dangerous. The law changes very slowly for a reason, and the reason why it takes so long to bring about reform is people need consistency. If the law changed from day to day, it would be very stressful. Nobody could rely on it. You couldn't have contracts. You couldn't enter into any type of agreements. Your businesses would fail. It needs a stable base. And to do that, because of that, you need a stable judiciary to keep it that way. 
when a new country, well, not new country, but I worked in Kyrgyzstan uh, to, with USAID. I went over with a few other judges to talk about the uh, rule of law, the separation of powers, and the independence of the judiciary away from parliament, away from the president, and why it was important. And uh, at the time, they had judges who were in parliament. I mean, they had no idea about the separation of powers. And it became very clear that they were administered in the, when the uh, Soviets were in power, they called it telephone justice. If the judges didn't know what to do, they'd get on the phone and call the party chairman and say, how do I rule in this case? Well, now you might as well have robots sitting up there. You don't have a rule of law. The United States has always been based on a rule of law. And the peace that we enjoy is directly related to faith in the, in the justice system. When that faith is eroded, that leads to anarchy. That leads to your riots in the streets. It is our faith in justice, our faith that we will be treated fairly, that encourages us to follow the law. That's a social contract. I will follow the law and I trust the government to treat me fairly in, in return. And when that goes, you, do, you have a lawless society. And it's whatever, go, whatever happens, happens, and there are no protections for anyone. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> sorry, no, no worries. I, I like to end on some topic that's very profound and thought provoking. I think that would be a really nice place to end. So I appreciate you being here. Well, please thank, help join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.